Oh, hey folks, I didn't know if this is recording or not. Um, every once in a while I do a story time here. Sometimes it's embarrassing for me. Sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's interesting. Um, I'm going to do this one right now um, for you because I had an interesting experience. It was really pretty cool. It's a kind of a cool time in my life, although I had nothing going for me. Um, right after I graduated uh, in 1982, early 82, uh, my ex-wife and I moved down with my mom's help uh, to Florida. She thought it would be a good idea. And in retrospect, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, in New York, when I lived in Long Island, it was fucking miserable. It was really hard. Uh, it was just hard. It was just really, really hard. And back in that time, the insurance per year on your car was more than I'm paying now here in Florida. It was, I mean, you know how it is in New York, anywhere in New York. So, um, and I didn't have too much that was kind of going for me, honestly. And, um, uh, I, I wound up taking a ride in a convertible with my mom's husband's daughter and her name was Abby and she was pretty cool. She was a hardcore Jewish girl uh, what you might call a Jap, a Jewish American princess, and her father was quite wealthy, and uh, he married my mom, and um, it was interesting living with a um, a Jewish family. You know what I mean? That's how I kind of got my you know linguistics down with with Jewish people. So um, Ed was a uh, ethical Jew. That was the guy who married my mom. He was quite old too, and um, a chronic uh, four pack a day. Uh, cigarette smoker. He was terrible. But um, he wound up getting uh, prostate cancer and lung cancer and he died and he died terribly. But my mom took care of him the whole time, uh, which he promptly, um, it wasn't really him. He was too sick to do anything, but the family just took everything. So my mom couldn't do anything. She, she got like the trailer or something like that because he lived in a double wide trailer, believe it or not, in a quiet place up here on Hillsborough Boulevard, ironically, right near Deanie's Hideaway. And if you've been here a while, uh, you knew what Deanie's Hideaway was. And that was the place where if you were a guy and you were well-equipped to handle women, curvaceous uh, women and so forth, then you went to Deanie's Hideaway and um, uh, you got involved in um, all sorts of different things. And uh, <laughs> they were all sexual in nature. But anyways, um, you know, it was like couples that joined and stuff like that. And uh, speaking of that, I'll, uh, I didn't want to turn this into this kind of a conversation, but... I will say it now because my friend MJ knows all about this. I used to have a customer that I used to cut the yard for, and uh, he was just your typical dumb guinea. And, um, you know, um, he was one of these type of guys who probably did a lot of misbehaving in his life in all various different forms. And uh, when they do this, they wind up trying to protect nature and little birds and little things and so forth. And it, and it becomes a way to make up for their um, terrible behavior over the years. And that's how he was. I finally got along with him, but like a couple times I kind of had it out with him. Not really, but, you know, I had to stand up for myself, you know, um, you know, cutting the yard over there. And he thought I wasn't, you know, professional. And I said, hey, you know what? You see this yard I'm cutting with your yard? It's getting cut with sharp blades. You see these sharp blades? I can shave you with this. That's what I use to cut this when I come here. You see my weed eaters? I put them on a rack so they don't break. Therefore, I have no reasons to give you excuses when I'm supposed to come. I had to kind of stick up for myself like that. But um, MJ knew about this guy because um, he, um, I forgot how it was, but I think his friend Kyle um, knew that guy or something. I forgot now, but he was big into racing. Not my friend MJ, but this guy. And his name was Joe. I, I won't say the last name. And uh, he, he, he had a rail car. And those are big time expensive. These were rail car racers. They go in a straight line. And I still remember that about him. And I guess he was kind of high up the totem pole there, so to speak. And, um, you know, he knew the hens, which I think were the, um, uh, the owners of the swap shop here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, they, they, he was very, very well connected. <laughs> and, um, again, folks, you're going to have to excuse me on this because this is, um, a little bit risque. You might want to take the young ones away from the speaker 
uh, for a little bit because we will cover this um, fairly in-depth. MJ already knows where I'm going with this. And uh, uh, what happened was, um, you see, it, it was just like I told my friend MJ. MJ bought a truck. And when he bought that truck, he was afraid I was going to buy it from underneath him. He didn't want to show me the, the car. He bought it at a Cadillac dealership, and it was ridiculous. The, 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 the truck was $99.99, and it was like a $24,000 truck. And it was one year old. It was a 99, and that year was it was 2000. So, I mean, it was ridiculous. The car, was, the truck was an extra cab Ford, which he has to this day, which I'd like to buy from him. But my friend doesn't understand that I saved him from the world of playing with Barbie dolls. But he won't understand that. But if he asks me, I will explain it to him because his big ambition was to become vice uh, manager of uh, Eckerd Drugstore. Hey, Eckerd Drugstore, really stocking up those Barbie dolls. See what I mean? Or uh, hemorrhoid cream or whatever the hell else it is. And he gives me uh, no respect. But anyways, I saved his ass and... What do I get from him? Nothing. Just humiliation. But, you see, he's going to die one day. And before he dies, he's going to say, you know what? That guy Paul was a pretty cool guy. You know what? If I would have loaned him money, I'll guarantee you he would have paid it back. And I wouldn't have to say anything to him. Uh, unlike my friend Kyle, who doesn't seem to want to pay me back at all. Right? But you can't explain anything to Egghead. Egghead does what he wants to do, but he'll still agree with me on this story, okay? Uh, so, I, evidently, he took over doing the yard or something like that. I forgot now. It was, maybe maybe he did. I forgot now, but I think he did. And um, when I was telling you about the thing with the truck, he wound up buying that truck, and um, it was great for about six months, and after about four or five months, um, it, it started not going when you press the pedal down, you know, because he pulls a trailer and everything, you know, and a lot of heavy equipment, and it just didn't go. And um, what happened was the it had uh, what was it? I forgot now the fuel injectors or something. It was it was more than that. It was the fuel injection system. It was a computer, and uh, um, it, it um, I already knew what it was back then. You could get somebody to do something like crack a fart for five thousand dollars, and. Uh, you know, now you can't. Now it's probably eight, ten thousand dollars. In fact, I got one customer that's got a Dodge um, Ram truck, and she lost her transmission, and it's like a 2011 or 2012, and she, you know, she can't get any parts for it. She can't get it fixed, so it's just sitting there. So uh, I asked her, "Can you get a, you know, rebuilt?" And she says, "Yeah, but it costs like uh, eight thousand, nine thousand dollars." I said, "Could it be that much?" She said, "Yeah." So. They don't do anything for 5000 but at that time, they did. That yeah, was back in 99, uh, in 2000 by that time. And uh, what happened was um, MJ called me, and um, he uh, he told me, he says, man, I got to take that thing in because I put my foot on the gas. It's not really going. It's going, but it's not, you know, it's not going to go for long. And I said, uh, man, don't do that. Just trade it in and get another truck. And he goes, no, no, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to go in. I'm going to see if it can be done cheap. I said, MJ, you see that you're six foot eight? You see that? They're going to know that there's a big sign that reads on your head, I'm good for $5,000. That's exactly what I told him. He'll agree with me if he watches this video. And um, sure enough, he went in there and they started at $5,000, I think is what he told me. But then they finished with him, I think, uh, under six, but I think it was more than 5000 But I was pretty much on the mark with it. And um, that's the kind of thing. It's when, when you're a big dude, um, you, you're going to roll with the big people. You know what I mean? You're going to roll with them. And that's what happened with this guy, Joe, which I won't, I won't say his last name, uh, even though he's a dumb guinea. Uh, and I should, but I don't want any problems, so I won't. I won't get into it. But um, anyway, so I guess Mario would go and talk to him, you know, when doing the yard. But you have to understand something: when you got two people um, working with you, and you're not sharpening your blades, and you have a bigger mower, and you've got two guys working for you, then from one dumb guinea to another dumb guinea, they're going to guinea it up, which is what happened with this guy Joe and my friend uh, MJ. And um, what happens is one guinea will start revealing guinea secrets to the other guinea. 
So what happened, and you see, I can't do that because I'm not like a six foot eight guy. And it all comes with the turf. Just like I told you, I'm good for $5,000 here when he took his truck in. I already knew that. Now it would be $12,000. But anyways, and this is in 2000, so this is 23 years ago. And it seems like yesterday. So um, <laughs> uh, Joe um, decided, uh, I guess this was a mutual thing with his wife there of many, many years. They needed to add a little spice to their sex life, evidently, or their romance life. So um, I can only assume that it was Joe, not his wife, uh, or maybe it was the other way around. It would be even worse if it was. But I think it was probably Joe's idea that the way to spice up their life was to go to Deanie's Hideaway, where my mom used to live up there on Hillsborough Boulevard, uh, just west of Lions Road, by the way. And I think it's still there, as a matter of fact. You know what? I will check on that for you. See if Deanie's Hideaway is still... They tried to shut that place down for a long time. It was one of those political things that every time they hired a mayor or something or... A, or a police chief or something. They always went after that place because it was well known. Let me let me see if that place still exists. Deanie's Hideaway. Permanently closed. Well, I can't say that I blame them. It's permanently closed now. But uh, let's see what this looked like. Um... Deanie's Hideaway was a very nondescript building, and uh, you can only imagine the merriment and the uh, various um, contortions that people were doing in there uh, on a regular basis. And it just so happened that I worked at the airport, and uh, you know, I I took one guy over to this place, and he was a little skinny. He wasn't little, but he was a skinny guy. And I asked him, I said, "Where are you going?" And he says, "Deanie's Hideaway." And I, you know, and I couldn't help but ask him, and I said. What's the big deal about this? You know, I said, what's the big deal? And he said, well, um, I'm invited because, you know, I'm put together well. And, uh, you know, the uh, couples want my services and they're willing to let me join in and so forth and so on. So I know, folks, this is getting kind of odd and weird, uh, very strange. So um, anyways, I asked him and he said it was purely sexual. That's what he told me. He said it was purely sexual. I said, well, do you, like, love these girls? Or, like, you fall in love with them? He goes, no, it's pure sexual. And that's all he said. That's all it was. So, um, anyways, this guy, Joe, uh, thought uh, it might spice up his, uh, his uh, sex life. So, evidently, it was a mutual thing. And um, this is what he talked to my friend uh, MJ about. Because MJ was uh, somebody they could rub their shoulders with and tell them some risque stories. So, of course, he'd never do this with me, of course. So, um, MJ told me that uh, he went uh, over to uh, Deanie's Highway with his wife. Evidently, this was a mutual, mutually agreed upon thing. And, um, well, one thing led to another. And um, MJ told me that uh, Joe uh, wound up... Um, uh, being in some sort of, of, of a position where um, he was um, doing something or another uh, to another girl, and it didn't involve the bottom part of his body. It involved this part of the body. And um, he had told my friend MJ that um, while he was uh, doing this thing with his um, this part of his body, that he was having a wonderful time until... Um, Another guy kind of came in and was uh, moving in very close proximity back and forth, and we will end it there. Um, I think you get the direction that this is going into. And uh, it's just a phone call, folks, which I am going to ignore. Sorry, the light is waning here. So, uh, anyways, what this has to do with the story, uh, my mom lives up in that area of um, Pompano, I think is what that was. It was actually Deerfield Beach, which is not the beach. It's over out west. Sorry for this cocksucking fucking bill collector call. Cocksucker will hang up eventually. So we're just going to have to wait it out. All right, fucking cocksucker. Interrupting my beautiful story, sort of. So um, anyways, uh, my mom uh, kind of helped me along there for a long time. And, um, well, when we got down here, uh, we had heard that this group, this singing group called the B-52s, and anybody that knew the B-52s knew 
that it was a big deal because uh, a B-52 was the first jet-powered bomber, and it was revolutionary. And uh, around 1978, they came out, and by 79, they were definitely out, but they were more or less in, like, the small clubs. And they were from um, Athens, Georgia, which I guess is a small-town area. No matter, it wasn't far from, I guess, from Atlanta. But they started building a following, but it was mostly in the clubs and stuff like that. And um, they never did chart at that time in 1980. So in 79, we were listening to a song called Rock Lobster, and it was very popular. And if you went to a, if you went to a high school graduation in 80 or 81, they were playing it. I mean, it was that popular, but it didn't chart. But a lot of people knew it, so this was kind of a niche kind of thing. And they had a very unique sound and a very odd, unique style. And um, their, their music was really interesting because they had two women who had harmony that were um, uh, Kate Pearson and Cindy something or another, Wil Wilson, and she had a brother in the, the band, and he died, and he was an awful nice guy. It just so happens I met them, and uh, that's what the story is about. So um, I was really big on them. I met Kate, uh, the, the, one of the singers, uh, when she came out of the Beacon Theater in New York City, my friend Ronnie and I went together uh, to go see them, and we waited around after the show, and sure enough, she came out, and she signed a poster for me, and she was really kind of digging it, because um, I, I said to her, I said, you know that song, Private Idaho, I said, that you sing, I said, is that, there's something to that, you're saying, uh, that you uh, beyond the gate, beyond the gate, what are you saying? And she said, that's very interesting of you that you would say that. Um, it's about nuclear power, and we should stay away from it. So it was interesting. She was a nice woman. And um, uh, what happened was, uh, that was in like 1980 or 81 or something, and I moved to Florida. And sure enough, they came down to Florida, and uh, they played at the Sunrise Musical Theater. Now, I know you'd have a hard time believing this, um, MJ doesn't know this story, so it'll be kind of a cool story if he wants to listen. Um, at the time, I, I had a wife, and her name was Mary, and, you know, we met each other in high school up in New York. She was uh, Puerto Rican, and it was really odd with her because she wasn't really terribly smart, but she was smart enough in a way to get a job as a head teller at a bank. So she was she, she was good with numbers, but I guess um, language really bothered her, so she couldn't really... Uh, do much with, with English. I, I don't know. She was somewhere in between. I'm not sure she understood much of anything. She kind of showed that she did. But I think she was kind of one of those Puerto Rican girls that wanted to gravitate toward American guys. That's what I think it was. Because when she left me, she went with another American guy who was a lawn dog on top of it. So I don't know what the deal was with it. I wasn't cutting yards back then either. But uh, that's the kind of guy she liked. But I don't know. And then she got hooked up with some cowboy or something. I told that story. Uh, now, I'll spare you that story, but uh, she met a guy who, well, actually, I'm not sparing you this story. She met a cowboy, some kind of cowboy guy, and uh, her typical thing was going down to Dania Highlight, where it was all Spaniards, you know, and then uh, she would get jiggy with it, and then uh, she met that guy, that cowboy, and she was well put together, but she was a little bit chunky, and um, um, she met that guy and decided that, that she, there's just no way she could sleep with him on the first night because she wasn't that kind of a girl and she had to kind of show that so she waited until the second date in order to get busy with him and evidently that meant something to her and it didn't mean much to him because he left her and uh, just so happens that my girlfriend was giving me a hard time too so I snuck over to her house one night and asked to come in and it just so happened she was there and alone and she was really sad because the guy had just said sayonara and he took off uh, drop off the keys, Lee, and get yourself free. Slip out the back, Jack, make new plans, Stan, all that. 50 ways to leave your lover. And so she was kind of crushed. <laughs> and it was really weird because, we, we, you know, we wound up doing it, and you know, she's crying, and I'm saying, what's wrong? You know, Is it like, am I that terrible? And, she's, and then she kind of told me that story. But um, it was important at that time because I kind of needed somebody at that time. That's what kind of happens. It's called sleeping with the enemy. But uh, we didn't have a bad divorce. It wasn't really a bad divorce. It's just that I met a bad girl after her, and uh, it was no good. Believe me when I tell you, it took me about three years to get the hell out of that. So, about yeah, it took me about three years to get the hell out of that. Maybe more. It took me maybe more. Maybe four years to get the hell out of that. And I uh, was lucky I wasn't killed. 
or um, in a different residence that had a lot of bars in front of it. But anyways, we won't get into it. Um, if I made it there, that's another story altogether. But anyways, um, so, um, uh, but, but she was attractive, certainly coming out of high school and, uh, she was well put together and curvaceous and I bought her a yellow and black, like stretch dress. And it was like thick yarn. It was kind of cool, it, you know, and it was, it would keep you warm in a club for sure, you know? And she wore black stockings, and then she wore that. And um, we were out on the floor dancing, and they played a B-52 song. And I said, Mary, they were playing that song, 53 Miles West of Venus. And um, I, I guess she didn't really remember, but I did. I was big into the B-52s. And they played this song right here, and it's an instrumental. <clears throat> it, it's... Um, it's on the last song on their uh, Wild Planet CD, I think it is. But I'll, I'll just give you a little uh, taste of it. And it's called 53 Miles West of Venus. Let me put this down. 53 Miles West of Venus B-52s. And um, this is it right here. And, um, you, you, you know, we weren't really dancing. But when I heard this, I said, Mary... This is 53 miles west of Venus. Let's go up and dance to it. And you had like a lot of disco people, you know what I mean? And like uh, the more common music. And they were, you know, they were dancing to stuff. And when this came on right here. You see, this has got like a really strange beat. It freezes black people. Black people can't deal with this. They're like, they're like black people can't deal with this. They just can't do it. And it's, um, it's not their fault. It's just that they can't deal with this kind of music. You know, it's like it's totally alien to them, right? So this is, uh, this is kind of like just this instrumental. And my, my, my ex-wife Mary there was getting into it. And I mean, she was wearing the smock and, and, you know, going down. And I had my bowling shoes on. That was my big dancing shoes at that time. And, and I mean, like, we're getting into it. We're cutting the rug pretty good out there. And I didn't realize it, but at about, right about at this part right here. 53 miles west of Venus, 53 miles and, and then at, right about at this time, at this time, uh, everybody started to exit the floor because they didn't know what the hell this was. And, and this was in kind of like a, a disco kind of arrangement. So it wasn't like a hardcore uh, you know what I mean? It wasn't like a hardcore place. It was more of a, you know, like a, a Studio 51 where they were playing, you know, it, it, it wasn't like punk rock kind of thing. You know what I mean? So nobody kind of knew. And what was weird was when they all left the floor and they turned on these spotlights and they put one onto my wife that was dancing and then like one on me. And, I, you know, and we weren't touching or anything. We were just kind of, you know, doing our thing to that weird song. And, uh, like, we finally realized what was go what was going on. We were out there alone, and the whole place was looking at us. There were a lot of people, you know. So, and then, like, the people gave us a little round of applause when it was done. And then uh, they, they kind of went to a break or something. There wasn't another song. And then we kind of got off. But the B-52s were very interesting because... They were really uh, very strange. Their whole thing was strange. But the girls um, had a very, very beautiful harmony um, in their voice. And it would take until uh, 1989 or 1990 before they scored a top 40 hit. And it was called, I believe, their first one was Love Shack. And um, Love Shack hit... And it was the um, uh, in the movie The Flintstones with Rosie O'Donnell, I think is her name. And um, it, it was recreating in live, um, you know, with real actors, The Flintstones. And then, uh, uh, I don't know, and they charted with, um, I think they might have charted also with um, Rome, R-O-A-M. And that was a beautiful song, too. But um, they had, a, it was a very unique, odd style of music. And um, what happened was, um, I, they were promoting uh, a song, 
uh, uh, the uh, their disc that they were coming out with, and I forget the name of it. It's called Whammy, and um, I didn't really care for it because it was it was odd, and I, I couldn't really uh, I didn't really catch it because I I only bought the cassette tape, and I was listening to it and I kind of. I uh, got a little bit of it, but I didn't really know too much about it. And uh, we wound up getting tickets to see their show. And um, so, uh, uh, I, I, let me see. I did get tickets. We went down to Ticketron or whatever it was back then. It was in uh, 82, uh, I guess. It was in 82 or very early 83. I think it was 82. Maybe it was 80. Yeah, it was 82. It was early 82. They were still big then. Uh, into that kind of thing, not their new stuff. Their new stuff made them uh, uh, famous in a different way. But um, anyway, so what I did was um, I had my wife, and I, I told my, my wife that they were coming to the Sunrise Musical Theater, and I wanted to get there early because I wanted to, you know, see if, you know, we could get there early just to make sure that we could beat the crowd. And um, I got there early, and it just so happens that I took my Frisbee, and it was me and my wife, and then um, we had a friend that came with us who was a guy, and he was into, like, British rock, so he wasn't completely into this, but he, he came along anyway. And um, what happened was uh, we were out there throwing the Frisbee, and um, what I did, and this was like an hour and a half before the concert even started. It was like two hours before the concert started, so I think it started at like 7.30, and we were out there at like 4.30 or 5 o'clock, maybe it was 5. And um, it was all beautiful out there at Sunrise Musical Theater at a lot of land, so it was all grass. So we're throwing the Frisbee back and forth, and um, I forgot to tell you that I, I just said, fuck it, and I wore my pajamas. I, I had a pair of green pajamas, and I wore them. I just said, fuck it, man, I'm, I'm going to, you know, let's do this right. You know, I mean, I still wore, wore sneakers, but what else are you going to wear to a B-52s concert but pajamas, of course? So I'm, I'm out there in my pajamas with sneakers on, throwing the, the Frisbee disc, and there's one car there, and the car is kind of, driving around a little suspect and out jumps a woman who's a substantial woman and she looks like a cop one of those, one of those kind of women long blonde hair and um, she walked up to me obviously uh, since I was the leader of this bunch or appeared and uh, she said what are you doing here <laughs> just like that like real real straightforward I said don't you know I said the B-52s are playing the B-52s you hear me? And like she was like, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> and and uh, she says, oh, you're you're big. You've heard of them. You're big on them. I said, of course. I met Kate at the Beacon Theater when I saw her up in New York City like a year and a half ago. She talked to me. You know, she signed my poster and she thought I was a nice guy. I thought she was nice. She said, oh, okay, and she left. So then. Uh, and that place was a nice place to see because it went up and you had good seats. I mean, any seat was a good seat there. So we went over there and we got our tickets and we were way up in the back. And um, my wife is there with me and uh, we're waiting for this to come on. And all of a sudden I feel a little tap on my shoulder and I feel this tap. And then I see one backstage pass um, with a chain going around my neck. And I, and I was like, I, I didn't know what was going on. And I'm in my pajamas. Everybody thinks I'm fucking baked anyway. So uh, the woman says, here's a pass. I said, what about my wife? And she said, just show them the pass and you can go back out and get your wife. But make sure you go to the left side of the stage and go by yourself. Don't take your wife with you first, but go back and get her uh, once you clear it. And it was one of really the nice times of my life because... Um, Aside from the dancing that we did, we were really pretty pretty much into this group, and um, she liked it too, you know, and uh, more or less, you know, she wouldn't like it now, because I think she kind of did it because I was everything American and everything fresh, you know, that was called New Wave back then, um, but she was heavily Latino, and she just kind of crossed over and became, after our divorce, she just became... Uh, Latino again, I guess is what that basically was. I haven't, I've never seen her since, except for that story I told you when I had my Chinese girlfriend, and I took her, I took my Chinese girlfriend over there and where I live to the movie theater. Just so happens that, that my ex-wife Mary was there, 
And she said, aren't you really nice to your Chinese girlfriend there, getting on your knee and asking her what she wants and popcorn and this and that? Why didn't you ever do that to me? And she called me. It was weird. That was a strange event. And, uh, the, you know, and she got the Chinese woman's number. I don't even know how she did that. I said, how did you get the number? She says, that's not important. Why didn't you treat me like that? Waiting on her with one knee, you're bending over like you were proposing to her, asking her if she wants popcorn or raisinettes or sodas. Why couldn't you have been like that to me? And this went on for like 15 minutes. It was really strange. I, I don't know what happened that day. It was, I don't even know how she got the number. I think my one of my sisters hooked her up somehow. I don't know. But it was weird because we had no contact for like two years, three years. It was 93 by then, I think what that was 92 or 93 and I hadn't seen her since like shit that was 89 it was a long time so um I wound up getting the backstage pass and in my pajamas I went uh to the left side of the stage they let me in and the b-52s were very nice and uh the guy Keith uh, Strickland was the drummer I talked to him a little bit and I asked him if, uh, you know, he liked this uh, music and if he, it was different than the other music. And I knew the producer, Rhett Davies. I, I know that he did like uh, The Pretenders and he did uh, somebody else, um, The uh, Talking Heads, who were also very big at that time. And they still are. Uh, Burning Down the House is a famous song and they still do it. Um, David Byrne is the guy from The Talking Heads. He's well, well known and kind of looked upon as a god, if you want to know the truth. Uh, in music, he's, he was that big. Um, he, they had an uh, album called Stop Making Sense, and it was like very, very popular. David Byrne is well, well entrenched in the gods of, uh, of the new progressive uh, rock movement, new wave, you could say. Uh, anyways, and black people like them too. I mean, black people really dug the talking heads. You can check that out for yourself. A lot of black men and women like the talking heads. And they were very close to the B-52s. So um, we got in and uh, they just had like a smorgasbord of cheese and and crackers and grapes and watermelon and uh, strawberries and this and that. It was just, it was really nice and we talked to them. And then um, I, we went to leave and the manager came up to me and she said, could you do me a favor? I said, what? She says, what are you doing tomorrow night? Uh, I said, um, I guess nothing. And she says... Do you think you could take the uh, me and the band um, and take us out of here tomorrow? And I said, I guess so. I don't see any reason why. And we had my mom's old Cougar or whatever it was. They were big cars. And uh, she said, okay, we'll come here at uh, 730. And um, it didn't work out. I, I, I came there at like 8 o'clock at night. And um, evidently they were having a really hard time because there's a lot of hillbillies here. And hillbillies really didn't understand the whole B-52s thing. And um, it was very odd, and you know they had a hard time getting into it. And a lot of them wound up like throwing beer bottles on the stage, is what she told me. And um, uh, as she went out with me, but not the B-52s. And um, she had to go and get. Um, um, she had to do something. I forgot what it was, but we took her. My wife and I took her, and um, uh, she bought me a full tank of gas, which is like forty dollars, because those uh, you know those old. Those old cars had like 30 gallon tanks or 33 gallon tanks. It was a, like it was like $40 or something of gas. And, um, you know, I filled it up and then I took her back and dropped her off. But I didn't get to meet them anymore. But it was it, it was still pretty cool. She just told me it was really dangerous because they were throwing beer bottles. And I and I told her, I said, yeah, you'd have to, you know, it could actually hit you and really harm you. She said, that's not what we were worried about. We were worried about it hitting a power um uh, outlet and short circuiting and electrocuting us up there on stage. Now, I didn't know that. So, anyways, what I'll do is I'll just play you a little clip here of um, a, a couple little clips here of the B-52s, and I'll show you a clip of it, and um, you can take a look for yourself at this very strange group that had a really beautiful sound, uh, but they were they they did this thing with the bouffants with the girls uh they were big into that the bouffants uh, and this guy right here was the brother of the girl on the left in the black 
Uh, they were brother and sister, and he died. He died, and um, I met him before. And he was a nice guy. He was guy gay, obviously. Uh, and he was a nice guy. He was a nice guy. I threw him a hat on stage, and he wore it half the show. He was a cool guy. Um, like a derby, and he, he wore it. Uh, but anyways, that's 53 miles west of Venus. And um, just to give you an idea of other, uh, other stuff that they had, to give you an idea... Um, I'll put on there, uh, the, the one that broke it open for him, where got them all into the scene, was Rock Lobster, and that's what they were really famous for, like in, in 1980, and I went out with that Jewish American princess in her convertible, and um, she uh, really uh, got into it, and I, I just started snapping my fingers, because I caught it right away, she said, you'll like this, and I certainly did, so, um, this will be a little bit of Rock Lobster, and I'll play like a couple other little clips. And, uh, sorry, we're in a commercial here. They played this at all these graduations all over the United States uh, around 80, 81. This was very popular, but never charted on the top 40. But you could see how it had a very interesting kind of, it was very different than what was happening at that time. It was ACDC, it was Led Zeppelin, you know, all that kind of stuff. So this was really breaking the mold, uh, to say the least. And they, their harmonies were so incredible. And he had taken um, two of the guitar strings off that guitar to get that sound. Um, that's why it has that sound. It was interesting. And uh, what I'll tell you, what I'll show you is uh, the song "Dirty Back Roads," um, which I remember well. And it was a really pretty song. And um, you can hear the harmonies of the of the girls. Um, dirty Back Roads, Dirty Back Roads, uh, and they do have a reaction, I think, to this, but um, this is, um, this is them, and, you know, like, I don't, I don't know what this is, but you can hear how odd this music was. And uh, Kate was so beautiful at that time, uh, she was into the uh, Egyptian thing. Bouffants kind of thing, and they were moving us into new ways. They, they were really responsible for it. Them and the, them and the um, um, uh, the Talking Heads, uh, Pretenders, um, some others, but these two in particular, the Talking Heads and Beat 52s, the Go Go's. They were a little bit more commercial and had more success. Like
and that's tame. They had much more outlandish stuff than this. This was very tame. Uh, and the B-52s really opened things up for other groups at the time. Uh, they were really strange, but um, if you knew about them, it was very interesting to go see them. Anyways, folks, take care. 40 minutes and 20 seconds of your life never to return uh, for some dumb story. See you later. Those are the B-52s, and they really opened the way to uh, the, um, the Go-Go's and all the other um, bangles and all that. They opened the way. Take care, folks. Bye.